team. Okay, yeah. right. thanks. Um, cool. So for the first round, what the goal was, was just to get kind of a mental map of all the drugs that are being considered for repurposing, either mm -hmm. the ones that are being tried in the clinic, so just off-label use directly, or mm -hmm. the ones that people are making predictions that could be a useful drug repurposing candidate, whether what's based source? on- What's the source? Uh, clinical trials or PubMed? Um, this is from the, everything is from the CORD-19 data set, so it, okay. has, it includes PubMed, it includes BioArchive, MedArchive, mm -hmm. and some Elsevier articles, but it's it's, the full spectrum of clinical, experimental, and silico literature. Okay. Um, so, we're, but we're interested in the full pipeline of drug repurposing candidates, not just the ones that are being tried in the clinic, but also the ones that have maybe some in vitro evidence from a drug screen, um, or even maybe computational predictions. So, like a molecular dynamics kind of a uh, docking sort of simulation for predicting why a drug could be useful. The reason being is because once we have sort of this map of which researchers are working on, you know, which drug repurposing candidates then we can join forces if this group has some maybe computational evidence why a drug might work, this group has some experimental evidence, you can quickly search that in the literature and you can reach out to those groups and then maybe share resources and keep pushing the drug through the translational pipeline. So it was just sort of to get a mental map of what are the drugs being considered out there. Um, to this end, we created the following dashboard, which I'll show you here. Um, okay, you can see my screen? Right. Again. So, so with this dashboard, you can do a simple search. So let's say we're interested in, uh, I mean, there's remdesivir, but let's say we're mm. interested in remdesivir. Uh, now I can look at all the papers where there's either clinical, in silico, or preclinical evidence that this drug is being used or considered for treatment, um, mm. either already in the clinic or people are just mentioning the potential of it being a repurposing candidate. This is happening with a very simple search of uh, co-occurrence of the drug mentioned with some kind of indicator, a trigger word that it might be used for a treatment. So whether it's literally treatment or synonyms of treatment or words like candidate, repurposing, etc. cetera. Um, so we retrieve those sentences from this CORD-19 set of papers. And then once you click on the paper, you can see some more context. So this is the abstract and the title of the paper that it comes from. This is where it was actually mentioned where that evidence is that uh, remdesivir might be a treatment that's being considered um, that we extracted here. And there's some metadata about the year, the journal, and citation count. There's a couple more little NLP tricks that we do here in this match quality thing. So we do a bit of negation, to, negation detection for one. We do a machine learning classifier to try to remove some false positives uh, here as well. Um, but this was the kind of, in the, the couple weeks that we had, this was the round one product that we created. This is great. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's, it was amazing having a, a team of data visualization uh, experts who could quickly whip up this dashboard. We had some NLP folk, we got machine learning folk involved, um, a pharmacologist in the team as well. So lots of different stakeholders. It was, re it was a really cool group of uh, team, you know, team effort. So as for round two, we want to continue, you know, extending this work. There are things mm -hmm. to do here in terms of like cleaning up the drug lexicon, you know, making some improvements on that front. But there are different directions we want to explore. For example, we want to um, do some adverse event extraction from the literature. So certain drugs, they have adverse events. Can we just pick those up? Um, and there are already models that are pre-trained to do this sort of thing. The second thing is we're interested in extracting all the different dosage that, dosages that are being considered for specific drug treatments. So maybe it's not clear what's the best uh, mm. dosage to use given that drugs are being used in an off-label way. So this would allow people to get a quick reference based on the literature, what other people are using for um, drug dosage. So this is just from the clinical literature of the CORD-19 data set. Um, and then another project that we're interested in is sort of like a meta discourse visualization. So uh, some people, let's say there's the study that Donald Trump cites very often about hydroxychloroquine is a great treatment, let's use it uh, all over the place. But then maybe that spawned you know, subsequent five, 10 studies saying, Hydroxychloroquine has all these effects. It leads to negative outcomes. Um, maybe it cites the original study uh, and says, you know, this study had all these flaws. And we can get a at a lot of that, both sentiment analysis and kind of like, you know, contrary evidence. So trying to right. visualize, topic model that over time. Um, that's another project we're interested in. So we have basically four, you know, kind of deliverable products that we want to do for the next round deadline, which is June 16th. Um, and that's what we have kind of on the horizon, but it, it's still early days of brainstorming and just, you know, ironing out the details. So that's where we're at. Right. So um, I have 
a couple of questions before I start describing what we are doing. One Please. is, uh, so you spoke about like, so this is like a search, this is like a very refined search engine and it only highlights what you want to see and that's what you have perfected with AI, I can see that. It's, it's great the way it works, uh, the various sources that you have integrated. And there are a couple of criticisms that I have received when I'm trying to do what I'm trying to do. So yes. this entire set of doing using PubMed, so we have stuck to filtering bioarchive and uh, using only PubMed in clinical trials so far. Uh, bioarchive, MedArchive solely because like that they will be scored differently only because they're not peer reviewed of course, and yeah. being in academia we know what it means right i mean yeah. it's a pandemic sure but then people who are decision makers need to be informed so what is the purpose behind doing this so when, when you're do, developing this platform and you're giving it to people um because as i understand that mostly in the united states and i think even in united kingdom um the structure of the clinicians is such that there is a protocol and unless that trial is approved, it you cannot give something to the patient even if the patient is dying, right? So in that situation, even if you have an engine like that, that's going to tell you that, okay, chloroquine does not work in these and these conditions. Uh, the one thing that you can definitely do is pair up groups fast, uh, make, it, make the clinical trials go faster. Uh, yeah, save some time there, sure. But uh, does any of your solutions focus on directly influencing decision making by the clinician or by the hospitals? For this product, uh, I put a big disclaimer at the top that we're not trying to suggest like you should use uh, this or this drug. We're just trying to have an exploratory tool of quickly kind of summarizing and exploring the literature. Sure. Very much, uh, you know, just kind of playing around there. Um, as far as the original question about um, clinician use case. Yeah, so this, to me, the, the clear use case is for researchers and connecting research efforts. Um, as far as a clinical use case, yeah, this was just to give visibility, especially maybe to, to pharmacists who are approving the prescriptions that doctors are making, like, okay, here's what other people have done, just kind of it's a reference to quickly digest the scientific literature rather than trying to do um, like a very comprehensive search right away. So it's to help facilitate in that way. Right. So those okay. are completely one of the things, one of the things that uh, in our discussions with an epidemiologist about like what an end product for it might be, um, was them saying that what they could see this being handy for essentially is a proxy literature review. So mm -hmm. for someone to be able to speed up the process of literature review uh, to figure out whatever whatever direction of research that they would be going. Yeah. No, and it's very much needed. I'm sure that this infrastructure doesn't even uh, exist in pharma to do it as quickly, even within the pipelines. I'm sure it does not exist because I have taken, so I'm a postdoc and I have taken multiple um, drug development classes only because I'm interested in it and very exhaustive ones by Cornell. Cornell here is like a very big medical school and then we have had people from Roche, blah, blah, blah coming in and then we don't, they don't talk about a very structured method even within their company. So yes, sure, it is helpful. Yeah. Okay, coming to my product uh, without wasting time is, um, so the idea started with uh, me looking at Twitter late in the night and um, going through multiple tweets where doctors had said, just I gave this to my patient and this happened. And mm -hmm. then I gave this to my patient and that happened. And then I pitched it at the MIT hackathon for the first time, far, um, so like far after when you had already started uh, working. So um, at that time in the MIT hackathon, it started getting like refined and refined. And what we realized is that even if you dig all the Twitter data, et cetera, for uh, those kind of studies, it's not like you cannot influence decision making. You cannot influence a clinician. You cannot save a life right now. And with time, and there are clinical trials which get documented. Um, and search engines like yours, of course, can speed up the process from that point on. What I wanted to do was, uh, before that happens, in case of any epidemic or pandemic, if we have this local knowledge, and because I come from India, in India, a clinician has the right to take uh, direct advice, uh, like direct uh, suggestions on what he can use on a patient. He does not have to go through approvals unless it, it is a major, major structure. Like if it is a hierarchical governmental hospital, sure. If not, he still has a discretion and you as a patient can demand things. So if the patient demands, it can happen. So 
uh, and I've seen this in my family that as and when, even when we had to go for unconventional therapies, uh, if, we, if we could convince the clinician to do it, the clinician would do it. Uh, and I had done it on my father's cancer. So uh, with that experience, I thought that, okay, what is the fastest way to act in a pandemic is to know what works. And then while talking to the Harvard doctors, we realized that people would call up their friends, that they would call up their friends in Italy and ask, what is working if your patients are dying? What, what is working? Because Italy was and really bad at that time and then thankfully it is recovering now so i was like if if you were asking another person but if you had a statistic to this and you could have an idea of what is really working so i my platform collects data from the clinicians who are treating patients and then sort of gives a score on who gave what what and how much it worked and what kind of patients so mm -hmm. in broad we are trying to develop an algorithm to be able to uh, like make, make sense of that data. And we aim to plug in a platform like yours, which takes only PubMed and clinical trials on one side and uh, also collects data from patients. So in the end, you get three scores. Uh, we are still developing the platform. So I'm sorry, I don't have it to show it to you, but it's like it gives you three scores at the end of it, like from source one, source two, source three. So if, if you only want to rely on hospital scores or a clinician score, you only look at that. If you want to rely only on clinical trials, you look at that. If you if you still think you want like a backup that the patient is saying that this is what works, then you take that. Now I understand that there are like the roadblocks that I face is collecting data from multiple countries, getting those, like approaching the right people to get those partnerships going on and so on and so forth. So that is the bottleneck for me. And the reason why I did this was uh, because like it takes time for people to write those papers, right? And it takes time for them to put those figures together to be able to publish, even if it is a bio archive. And you see a lot of half-baked studies because of that. But mm -hmm. say somebody is looking only at interleukin-6, for example, rather than doing the whole cytokine profile. That's okay because we are in a pandemic, but still. So uh, keeping all of these factors in mind, I wanted a quick real-time sort of idea of what is happening in which corner of the world and how to like quickly access that knowledge. Um, so recently I've been also talking to the a Chinese accelerator and they told me that there, are, there were a lot of Chinese traditional me medicines that people were taking as a prevention and um, you know that that kind of data can also be integrated. So we are trying to reiterate and develop uh, the data sets further. So th that is what we are doing. It's more on the clinician side. Um, a platform like what you are developing rightly integrates as one of the score points uh, for us, but it comes much later. And your platform is very, very valuable. Yes. Uh, at a stage where enough is known, so say six months into a pandemic, sure, your platform rocks, definitely. Because you have documented literature where anybody will believe in it will influence decision makers, though you're not planning to do so, it will. So that way it would be very, very beneficial. But what I'm thinking about is the first, second, third month when you don't know what to do. You suddenly have a disease not much is known about and what, what, what can you do about it? So that is uh, where it's a platform. And right now we are developing the background infrastructure. I'm not, I am not... Um, what do you call bioinformatics or a machine learning person. So I am myself trying to understand how that happens with the team. So I'm putting together uh, a team of experts who can teach me what they're going to do with the things. And I'm involved in partnerships and uh, getting clinicians on board and getting people to give the data here. So that is, and, um, and basically the idea, the concept came out of here. So trying to make it happen. <laughs> so yeah, that, that is my role and that is what we are trying to do. So now that we know what we are, each of us is doing and if you, so what I would like from you, to be very honest, is um, um, if you could uh, like um, have um, go through our platforms once they're ready and um, also the AI pipeline and understand and help us um, like understand if what we are doing is correct and what needs to be improved, et cetera, when it comes to the analysis and help us with global partnerships, that would be very, very helpful at this moment in time. Because uh, we are also in the process of registering uh, not-for-profits, so really debating where and how. I can't do it in India because the process is very slow and I don't want to wait. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's where, uh, where it is at right now. And I also understand that we are running short of time. I don't know that once all of this ends in the next two to three months, how interested will people be in really contributing to this? Because when even we return to our normal lives and jobs, 
um, I don't know how much time will we have to be able to do this and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, so that that is what we are doing, and I would be very happy to um, understand if we can, um, like, what we can do together. Cool. I have about like four comments based on what you said. So sure. <laughs> uh, let me list my comments. Um, so the first thing you had mentioned that I forgot to mention is, yeah, this does include preprints, and I think that whenever we include a preprint, there has to be a big, you know, it, the metadata that this is a preprint has to be obvious. And I completely agree because hmm. obviously we hold preprints to a different standard. And so we just tell them up front, this is, you know, use this information at your own risk because it's not been peer reviewed. So I totally agree with that. And that's something that needs to be totally transparent. Um, the second thing is that on like where this kind of fits in, I was kind of actually envisioning that this maybe doesn't go directly to the clinician, but maybe it goes to an authoritative database that gives kind of helps motivate clinical decision making. Yeah. For example, maybe the curators of like the up to date database where, you know, doctors will look at, okay, what's the latest results for um, chloroquine or whatever. The person who's curating that database can maybe look at a tool like this and easily go through the literature. And so those sorts of people or the people who are leading like grand rounds for a hospital, maybe they're trying to just quickly collect the information to present it to everybody. And that indirectly is influencing decision making. So I see this tool fitting in at that point. Um, a third point you mentioned month one, two, three. I think that that's inherent, an inherent lag of us having to deal with scientific literature because the, the, the reality is that like, you know, the clinical studies get published relatively slowly. So we're going to be operating naturally on that four to six month timeline because we're, you know, grounding ourselves in the scientific literature. We could augment our data set with like social media data like you've been doing and that that's a way to start tackling one, two, three or going directly to the patient. That sounds amazing too. Um, that just hasn't been our focus at, at this time. And I see how we are, we're taking these interesting like orthogonal approaches to tackle the common problem. Um, you mentioned needing help with global partnerships. I mean, that sounds awesome because I'm also interested obviously in trying to get this tool into the right hands of who needs it and you have the same interests. And so I'd be interested in seeing if we can join forces to make a super tool. Maybe we can give it to right. the right people. I think that that would right. sound amazing. And I don't have, off the top of my head, I don't have the immediate um, people who are in that global partnership, but maybe you're already establishing those connections. I think you're further along in that part than-, than no, 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 <laughs> no. Well, then we yeah, are at the beginning. No. Talking, <laughs> yes, successfully, no. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe Daniel has more ideas about global partnership. Yeah, this is probably where we, Daniel's probably going to pull in and give something to say. We're, we're, we're just, we're, we're still in a really early stage in terms of figuring that out, but we do have a couple of people who we're beginning to talk to at, at, the, at the early stages municipally in the Canadian government. Um, we have a lead we're kind of looking at at the Australian government, and we just had a conversation today with somebody in the federal uh, U.S. Uh, government, uh, a different a different branch of the response side, but um, I love the idea of us being able to try to to collaborate on figuring out how do we both uh, the the sort of that orthogonal that Dan's talking about, I think it's key, and looking at what are any of the other projects people are working on, which are also complementary to those. One of the things that we're doing a lot of is trying to reach out to, to folks like you and to other people so that we can come up with a more comprehensive understanding of what the landscape is of all the different people working, and that that way we can much more easily pull together something that's compelling, clear, and comprehensive that we can then be pitching to, to any of the different organizations who could actually benefit from it. Right. Um, yeah, that makes sense, yes. Yeah, I think the more that our bottom-up efforts can join forces, I think the, the stronger and the better. So I, I think Yes, agree. definitely, definitely. That is that is true, though I must uh, admit that we are far behind as far as building the infrastructure to process the data is concerned because the rate limiting step is that I myself cannot uh, do a lot of machine learning. And I have to like understand, uh, I mean, I have to understand and work with a person who does not understand the science. So um, that is kind of a lack phase. But what I also want to do at the end of this entire exercise is that if somebody stops me from not giving me the data, so just to understand what does not work, because as a researcher, it's great to know what works, but your mindset is also to know what does not work. And um, I like, the whole idea behind this is that this is not the first pandemic and this won't be the last. Um, the, the way we have dealt with our ecosystem, we'll have many more in future. And so we need to start building things that if it is, it is definitely not helpful for COVID-19 because it's, it, the time is lost, but what can you do for the next one? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that's, that is the vision here. And sure, at some point, if we can uh, really like, if we should keep exchanging knowledge and information as we develop, um, 
I would love to like a uh, beer if you want to have some brainstorming because that's my forte and uh, stuff like that. And if at a stage where we need we need technical support, if some partnerships work for us, I I would be happy to direct them to you. If they work for you, uh, if you're happy to direct them to me, and that's then that's exactly it. Yeah, that's so exactly how we think. And is the 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 bigger the web we can spin, and the more strong connections we can build, the better the network works, the distributed system. And exactly, if we if we as an organisation start building really strong links, and we say, well, there's three partner organisations that we're working with on similar projects, and they are working at a different angle, but trying to solve similar problems. And the same goes for you if you find connections, and it's just about um, building that that distributed network of skills i mean the the amount of time i look at the corona wide like skills matrix was built now and the amount of skills and talents that are there it just blows my mind like professors and do doctorates coming out of his ears and phds across like a whole spectrum of skill sets and specialists in and not only just specialists in that we've got people who are commu you know capable communicators which is important to be able to try and get people on board and to understand it because yes Science is, you know, one scientist and another scientist in two different disciplines don't talk well to each other. Sometimes you need someone in the middle who can translate your science and your science so you both can speak the same language. And better than that, take your science, your science, and a layman who's not involved in either of the sciences but needs to take that information in, turning that into usable, consumable, quantifiable, and, 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 and uh, understandable information and make it, 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 the impact of com, of good communication cannot be understated in making a real difference when it's when it's going to be local councils who are not going to be machine learning experts or medical experts, but they're going to be policy experts. And we need to understand the policy experts need to understand everyone else's skill set. And sometimes communication is the important part, and having sure. a network of a good communicators is important to bring the whole thing together. Yeah, one one I can see a couple of things already where there may be some useful uh, useful um, bits of knowledge sharing or resource sharing. So certainly we have a lot of people who are here who are who are deeply steeped in NLP. Um, one possibility that could that could be there, especially around that ideation and brainstorming piece as well, is if you all have a Slack channel. I know that the MIT Slack channel is still going for the hackathon, but mm -hmm. I, that'll die down. Um, we can always make a bridge Slack between our two, and of course, any of your people are welcome to to dive into ours as well. Um, but we can host all of it if you want, or some of it, or just a bridge, however you want. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Um, we also have um, a couple of people, like we have a fellow in the Netherlands who's doing, who is a bioinformatics startup, but he's familiar with the kinds of issues and strategies with bringing in data, especially from uh, from the public, from people who are in the hospital system and such. So a lot of the, a lot of the wrinkles that are involved in that, we have some people who can help figure that out. Right. And. Yeah, I, I, I could see a few different ways that, that things like that could, could be helpful in terms of So that. in the end, when your platform is uh, ready, um, so yeah, two questions. One is, um, so you have the funding in place to be able to develop all of this? Right now, that is, we don't have, because we're not a nonprofit yet and we don't have um, sort of that accounting treasury side done, we're not taking in any funds right now. We're holding off on that. We're just taking in infrastructure sponsorship. So we've mm -hmm. got a lot of infrastructure that's in place, uh, but we're we're actively resisting any any funds at this point. So, which also yeah, we, means we, that you will not be gathering data. A, a, am I right in understanding that? We're, right now, we're only dealing with avail already available public data sources. We're okay. talking about, and there's a couple of people who are exploring the ideas of different ways that we could be seeking data, mm -hmm. uh, but we're not doing it yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, what's the other one? I forgot. So, uh, what, so what is the end and what is the end point for this? So the coronavirus right. would go at one point in time and this, so what is the one thing is sure, like he said, uh, Dan, that will influence. Sorry, just one second, I'm just going to cut. To, oh, there we go. So you would influence decision making and all that. So. What, what is the end vision? What is the major end point vision right. for this platform? Yeah. So, so right now it's, 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 it's kind of like a nose dive with a plane, but right now, you know, the bullseye we're shooting for is COVID-19 and what impact we can have on there. And so that's the focus. Uh, but our plan is to pull out from that and look at what of the infrastructure that we're all able to build, both in terms of the specific assets we create, but also just the ability to pull people together to do this mm -hmm. kind of work uh, for the next pandemic and the one after that. 
Um, but we're also looking beyond that at which of these things can generally be used, um, the sort of next step out in terms of, of global health uh, and the different ways that this can impact that, and more widely, how, how are we able to take the things we're learning and the tools we're building to apply to other global challenges? So, you know, some other challenge that we can crowdsource people around, organize them effectively, um, do all of those other pieces of like the PR and the sponsorships and all of that get figured out uh, and bring that all to bear on having some kind of an impact on an issue. So it's, we're, we're thinking definitely large in terms of what it can be and it's something that will be a long lasting organization. Um, but of course, the way to make that work is to nail our impact in terms of what we can do on COVID-19. Right, right. That, 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 that's a good vision. I mean, I believe in things which last beyond just the problem right now. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's good to know. Let's, let's oh, not have big, to reinvent oh. the same wheel again next yes. time. Happens. That's exactly our. Pre we, we, we're very much about not reinventing because to point one of the reasons why we're trying to pull different networks of different people doing the same things is like exactly if someone invents a pipeline to solve our problem, like it's going to be open source. We intend to have it open source and open shareable. So if we've created a, a solution that works for us and that solution works for six other people trying to do similar but not the same things, like why, yeah, don't reinvent the wheel. Use ours, iterate on top of it. And if you come up with something, well, you know, it's again, it's just about sharing knowledge, sharing experience, sharing skill sets, and bringing everyone up and making everyone just that. And and once that network exists, and that and we can start not only just networking it's it's about bringing all them different network organizations and nodes that exist and make them all fucking talk to each other properly because there's and, so and many so, of them yeah. just don't. And, and and i think i think with that piece also um we'd be interested in finding out as you do start collecting in some of the data that you're going to be collecting um it would be great to to look at that and to see which of that data might be able to help kind of reinforce the efforts that, that we're doing here right sure can you, can you hear me? Am I back on? Yeah, you are. Yep. Oh, perfect. Um, so I, I missed, I missed a, a bit here and there. Um, but I wanted to ask, Nimi, how are you, um, have you been able to navigate the, like, mentors and partners from the MIT um, challenge, who I know there was a whole, um, there was a whole, uh, I don't know, packet or um, something like that that came out, just like ways to connect with them. Um, right. beyond the beyond the hackathon in terms of like I don't know just resources like getting mm -hmm. in touch with people to help help you develop ideas and whatnot um, have you in terms of like global partnerships like on that topic have you been able to like get in touch with anyone um, just I don't know have you been able to like utilize that resource at all right so the MIT uh, resource has been working like uh, not the best for us, I would say that the coordinators who were immediately co coordinators for our team has have worked very well in supporting us and introduce, uh, uh, introducing us to connections. But when that comes to that connection, the response rate is slow um, and I don't know, it fades on and off and things like that. So I've like taken it upon myself and my immediate group of friends to be able to connect with people. And um, that is working better than the MIT uh, consortium for yeah. me. I don't know, like, for example, you reached out to me and this is fruitful, right? So um, this is like we scheduled a call in the next two days and it's happening right now. And uh, I'm getting to know, say, Dan and Daniel and stuff like that. And people like you who have similar vision and are working on something similar. But when it comes to reaching, I think it also depends on who you're reaching in the hierarchy. So if MIT yeah. is going too high, then that's that's that response rate has been very slow for me. That's my experience. How how has your experience been in in getting a response? Um, well, I haven't um, I haven't uh, like reached out to reached out to any like all of the because uh, besides the like I posted on the about I posted about Corona Y on the like the different channels there um and i had like comments here and then about like questions um but nothing uh like i uh on one of the posts i um like set attention to like any medical um like when we we're looking for medical annotators um but yeah yeah there's not there's not a whole lot and i'm not sure if maybe because a lot of the a lot of the people there are like medical professionals if they're just really like busy at the moment or um or what but yeah that's that's just been my um the extent of my 
um, like my attempt to connect. I, I was just curious to see if you've had any success to, um, so I know, okay, the. I mean, volunteers are doing a great job there. That's that's all I can tell you. But then when it comes to the next person, it's it's not yeah. working out. With the mentor network, it's not working out that well. Yeah, okay. That's that's good to know. Mm. One of the things I was just mentioning to, to our team right right before you came on the call is that we're also, because we're starting to connect to other groups, we're, we're finding out things like there is a group in Edmonton who's doing CodeVid19, it's a giant hackathon, they've got about 1600 people worldwide. They're going to be winding down at the end of the month, um, so we're going to be looking at trying to onboard some of their people onto here. And so that's, oh, yeah. that's the kind of thing that when we're talking to them or to anyone else, I think what would be great is if we can get just short overviews of what teams like you and other teams are doing, then we can make sure that we're shopping those around as well. So that when, we, when we're talking to a group like that, we can say like, hey, if there's anybody who's interested in hacking on a project like this, they really need NLP or whatever it is that your needs are. And then we can try to, to, to source people for each other as well. Right, so our entire project is on DevPost. Uh, I, yeah, so that is there and I can share that link with you and give you um, one or two line pitch about it. That's, that's uh, so maybe if, if you're doing that, then thank you so much for doing it. And I would also appreciate if you could, like uh, we'll connect on LinkedIn, I believe after this, and uh, if you could keep sending me the links of whatever is happening and I'll keep in touch with the community. And okay. maybe sometimes I have an idea uh, of collaboration that uh, I can come and let you know. So we can keep doing that, like supplementing and ideating all the time. I think that that would be great. And I love our that. calls are our calls are public, so you can join them. At the you can join team calls if you've got anything interesting you want to say or you want to join in, and they're they're all published and recorded. I mean, one of our team members, uh, and I think Ogley as well mentioned it about EU versus the virus, which is five thousand specialists across Europe are doing mm. a hackathon. Have doing a hackathon this weekend. And we've we've thrown a team in there. I have absolutely no intention of actually producing or con commenting or anything. I am literally just shopping for people like medical professionals and bioinformatics. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, I am gonna, I am shopping <laughs> for people. That's all I am doing in there. <laughs> I am like, when you know, end of this weekend when you've got nothing else to do. I mean, if you want to carry on working, um, we've got people who yeah. might who could actually use. That's all I'm doing right now. I'm just shopping for people who, who are going to keep interested and who are, who are yeah. mentally and physically focused, and that's what. That's going to be the best advantage for anything. I, I will add there in that their channel too, but I find it, it it to be very low action. I don't know for some reason. Right. One of the other things that we can probably share is some of the strategies that we're each developing in terms of, of making partnerships and figuring out what's working and what's not. On that partnership note, another thing we do right now on our website, we just are listing some of the sponsors who we mm -hmm. have. But as we're starting to, we're beginning to get a bit of press and a little bit of notice that's out there. Um, and we can also have a section for partners so that we can list you there and list other other organizations who are working in, in a similar vein to yeah. us. The, the more we're able to do that and gain eyes on what we're each doing, mm -hmm. that's a great way to bring in people who we who none of us know, but who can help. Right. Yeah. I, sure, sure, sure. Let's make it happen. I mean, um, I'm cool with everything. Just that um, while we are registering something as an organization and things like that, at that point, I think we should be very clear about expectations from each other um, because that is when the data sharing, et cetera, comes into force. Till, till we are ideating, till we are exchanging resources, all is good. Yeah, yeah. I think that's great. And then we can, we can work together to sort of begin figuring out what that'll look like. So that as soon as one and then both of us manage to figure out our organizational structure in that way, then we can just hit the ground running and whatever that ends up looking like. Yeah, that sounds good. And um, I think what we can also do is like I'll have some of uh, my other partners come in when, when we do uh, the next call as and when. Um, right now, my focus is very much on progressing because all like once I have something in hand, I'm in comfortable talking about it. So uh, all talk, talk and no action is not. Me. So <laughs> I, I would like to do that. And once as and when I have leads, I can keep mailing one of you or whomsoever is the primary contact and talk to you. Um, and also, Dan, I will really like to talk to you a lot because you've done all the analysis and built the whole pipeline. So, uh, I mean, I, will, I really look forward to gaining your expertise and support. Yeah, I was about to say, Nimi, I'd love to keep in touch and we should definitely keep chatting about this. Um, you also mentioned you wanted some feedback on like the machine learning aspect of the pipeline. We have lots of excess capacity with NLP and machine but, learning people working maybe. on this project. We, we projects, are so. like, I spend half of my time when people turn up with them skills going, 
have a look yeah. around because yeah. I don't really have anything right now for you to do. But this is like the three teams that are needing these skills, but they're not needing. Honestly, we, we have a glut of NLP machine learning yeah. people sat around not doing anything. So the more they could be useful elsewhere. And, you know, that's fine by us. Yeah. So yeah when, my, when did yeah, you start? Like, when did you start recruiting volunteers? <laughs> because 900 volunteers is a lot of people. <laughs> like two weeks ago, right? I don't know. Yeah, three weeks. Um, Three, three weeks, weeks are we on ago. now? Three, nearly four weeks? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think, Daniel, you, you mentioned this having perhaps a, a bridge channel on Slack. Uh, yeah. I think that would be helpful in terms of just like passing along um, like mm -hmm. NLP people that we get in, but don't have like specific yeah. tasks for. And that'll also make it really easy for, for, for Nini and Dan. You can just kind of, if either of you is having a, a question or an idea, you can just tag each other there and be able to... to yeah. yeah, we don't have an official Slack channel of communication yet. Uh, I was debating between Slack one? and Telegram. Uh, so, because I, I don't know, I'm just reading on Slack and the, da the data, uh, you know, the, the transparency options and then their data sharing and everything, I was not very convinced. But if, if Slack works for you, especially with this exchange, I'm fine with it. Hmm. I, think, I don't even know why we started with Slack other than a lot of coders use it. It's just a really common tool for mm -hmm. data people and, and, and tech communities. I only had it for that reason. I, I think Telegram is more popular in the communities that I've seen. Um, I don't know, because of some faith, trust. I don't Interesting. <laughs> well, it, it sounds like we've got a lot of good. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ogami. Oh, no, 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 no. no. That was... I, I was just going to say that it seems like you know we have we have a bunch of good sort of productive next steps forward. You know, uh, Mimi and Daniel, if you will be in touch, uh, mm -hmm. we'll cover LinkedIn. Uh, we can uh, talk about you know if you want to be up there on a partner thing. Are you all right if we post this video on our? Um, public uh, area? Oh, no, 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 fine, go ahead, please. Okay, great. Because um, that, that can also draw a couple more eyes and we'll make sure on that that we also link to, if, if you send us any link to what it is that your organization I'll has. send you. Okay, then we'll yeah, I was going to say, could you um, share, like, because all I have is just your posts from, um, from the Slack channel. If you can right. send, like, if you have a website or, like, a, I don't know, ways to... So the best uh, way to connect and contribute is the dev post channel that we have, which shows the progress uh, with time. So what I'll do is I'll send like a two minute, uh, two liner um, detail about what we do and mm -hmm. uh, with, a vid with a dev post. So that has videos, everything of whatever we have done so far. So that that is, uh, I think that is sufficient for, for this at the moment. Perfect. Yeah. I, I have to run right now, guys. But Nimi, what's the best way to connect? Should we exchange emails or LinkedIn? Or... LinkedIn, I think is, um, what you can do is, um, yeah, I think, uh, can you, uh, is your name pronounced as Ogali? How do you pronounce your name? Ogali, yeah. Ogali, Ogali, could you help us connect, uh, like people in, could you help me connect people in this call on LinkedIn? That would be. Yeah, yeah, definitely, really definitely, yeah. Sweet. Sounds great. Looking forward to chatting more soon. Same here. All right. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank and yeah. you. And sorry again for being late. I was late. Sorry. <laughs> we understand. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Cool. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Take care. You too.